your space journey. NASA's SpaceX Crew 2, Mission Specialist Astronaut Thomas Pesquet, and ESA's new program for including astronauts with disabilities in future space missions, all coming up in today's episode. Three, two, one. Welcome to your space journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Thanks for joining me today for the first episode of Season 2. I'm your host, Chuck Fields. Let's get started. Later in this episode, we're going to feature my recent interview with French astronaut Thomas Pesquet, who's going to be mission specialist on NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 mission, currently scheduled to launch in late April. Thomas will be the first European to fly on board a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft, which is exciting by itself, but particularly exciting for the European Space Agency, or ESA. Now there's a lot going on in ESA right now. Starting March 31st, ESA will begin accepting applications for new astronauts, the first time looking for new astronauts since 2008. ESA is strongly encouraging women to apply as they seek to expand greater diversity. So if you live in Europe or have friends that do, please encourage them to apply by visiting ESA.int. Now along with diversity and inclusiveness, ESA is also launching their Para-Astronaut Feasibility Project. The goal of this project is to assess what it would take to include astronauts with disabilities in future space missions. Earlier this month, ESA held a press briefing where I asked ESA Director Yusuf Hoshbacher about this project. Here's a clip from that conference. So maybe let's start with a question from Chuck Fields from your space journey. journey. Um, I think this is a question for you, Josef. Jack is wondering if uh, you can tell us something about ESA's new para-astronaut feasibility project uh, as part of our new ESA recruitment campaign for astronauts. And if Thomas will be in one way or another uh, be involved in this or be, inform be performing any tasks during his missions related to the para-astronaut feasibility project. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Ninia. Um, Yes, it is quite unique that uh, a space agency is looking for uh, astronauts with uh, some uh, um, uh, disabilities, um, uh, as we call it. Uh, and this is um, a call that will be opened uh, in parallel with the astronaut call, 31st of March. Uh, we will uh, ask for applications uh, for from people who are, of course, uh, uh, very fit mentally and with their motorics and their ability to handle stress and uh, uh, to have all the other qualities of astronauts. but they may have a physical disability uh, and uh, we would like to accommodate that. Of course, we need to see based on the candidate what this disability might be. We have indicated uh, some categories which uh, we think are the, the ones that are uh, uh, that we can handle on the space station. Uh, but then, of course, we need to, to see what it means uh, to accommodate for, for those. Uh, some changes may be in the setup, uh, maybe even some uh, uh, some changes to some of the hardware, uh, but this we have to, to then study. And what we will do actually is a feasibility study then of uh, such an astronaut being able to uh, travel to space um, uh, with the disability which he or she uh, will have. Uh, but this is quite an important project. It's the first time ever that the space agency is doing that. Uh, for me, it is also personally important because I'm defining a new agenda 2025 where um, I really uh, put a huge emphasis that uh, space is not uh, only reserved for a small circle of uh, exclusive people, but it's really for everyone. Uh, and everyone means really everyone. Uh, 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 and uh, this includes also para-astronauts as one symbol uh, that uh, I hope uh, to be able to fly to space uh, pretty soon. This is definitely an exciting time for space travel, and we applaud ESA for opening up space to everyone, including those with disabilities. Now on to astronaut Thomas Pesquet. Thomas will be a mission specialist for NASA's Crew-2 mission, which is currently scheduled to launch no earlier than April 22nd, 2021. For this second full rotation mission, Thomas will join three other crew members, NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrell and Megan MacArthur, plus JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide. Now, I was fortunate to participate in NASA's SpaceX Crew-2 astronaut press conference in early March, where I asked the crew how they hoped this mission will inspire others to pursue a career in space exploration. 
The first response is from Crew 2's commander, Shane Kimbrell, and the second response is from Tama Pesquet. All right, let's take another question from Chuck Fields with Your Space Journey. Thanks for taking my call. Um, Human space exploration is growing remarkably fast, and this international mission with the refurbished spacecraft is a great example of that. Uh, this is for anyone. How do you hope this mission will inspire others to become astronauts or pursue a career in space exploration? Well, you know, we're going to do our very best to, to represent um, NASA and, and ESA and JAXA and SpaceX um, and the International Space Station. And hopefully by just our actions and the way we, we're professional uh, and the way we have a good time as well, um, that'll just translate into some kind of inspiration for somebody. I don't know um, who's out there that's watching, but uh, as you mentioned, it's an international crew. So that in itself um, can just show the possibilities that are out there. And uh, uh, I'm not, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump on that, but that's all I have. I think it's great. I think the fact that that Megan is our pilot and she's awesome should inspire a lot of girls as well. And we're trying to have, we're trying to reach 50%, you know, in in uh, in the application selection for the astronaut selection. This is difficult, but I think the the, the fact that we have Megan and uh, is certainly helping the cause. And I'm I'm hoping next astronaut selection for ESA is going to be 50% male, 50% women, hopefully. Now, after the press conference, I was fortunate to actually interview. Toma by phone. Uh, there were a couple of journalists on the call. We had a great time. First, we asked him as mission specialist what were going to be his science research duties aboard this upcoming mission. There's a lot of good science coming up with us or before us or being already there on the space station. Um, one that I really like that's very big on the space station right now is called a, what they call it tissue engineering. It's really building some tissue um, artificially. Uh, and the reason why we look at this on the space station is because um, people believe that there's a lot of mechanical processes at, um, at the cell level that are influenced by gravity. Uh, and if you put yourself in the microgravity um, weightlessness on the space station, then you're not influenced by this and you can have much cleaner uh, cell building processes. Uh, so right now there's, a, there's an experiment that's a European experiment, it's actually French, I think. It's, um, they, they send up stem cells for, uh, they, call, they call them mini brains, so it's pretty much brain cells in a petri dish and they're going to try to see uh, how to reverse aging phenomena on those on those brain cells so obviously um it's it's um in a, in a, in relation to alzheimer's disease or parkinson's disease and we could have brain spur um, in those areas and there's also artificial retinas um like eye tissue being sent up there um, and which is pretty amazing to me because if you think of the applications. So it's, it's mostly medical, but there's also, of course, you know, fluid physics, combustions, plasmas, um, and protein crystal growth and things like this. But to me, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm less familiar with the medical side of things. So I'm always very impressed by, by what we do on space station. And yes, we're trained for spacewalks. Uh, right now there's a pair, I mean, between two and four, not... Uh, not uh, entirely confirmed yet, um, slated for our increment, and it's mostly about uh, augmenting the ISS solar arrays. Um, now they're, they're starting to be a little bit old. They've been up there for 15 years, some of them, um, and the station is always bigger, always more uh, power hungry. Um, so we're going to uh, come up with a couple uh, pair of solar arrays that are going to roll. They're going to be rolled up. They come up in a, in a cylinder and then they unroll. Um, and we're going to install this. We should be installing this uh, this summer. So it's going to be exciting to do and to watch, hopefully. And I understand that becoming an astronaut was your childhood dream. I was just wondering, as a young boy growing up in France, is there a memory that you can share that motivated you to become an astronaut? It is, uh, so it's, it's, it's funny because sometimes I look back and um, there, there's no... Um, there's no big event that, that happened and changed the course of my life. I think what happened is really my, my parents in, encouraging me, um, even though that seemed kind of ridiculous because, you know, I was living in a small village. Um, I didn't know anybody who was any even loosely related to space or even to aeronautics for that respect. Uh, but just, you know, buying the magazines and looking up stuff and going to a library and, and doing things like this. Um, and then eventually I made my way into college and then I studied aeronautics and space and then I became an engineer and then I became a pilot. Uh, so I think it was really one step at a time. There was no uh, huge big figure that I could 
look up to because it was just too remote for me. I couldn't picture myself doing this because I was just this normal small kid from a normal small town. Um, but I think it's just uh, just the, the merit of, of my parents nurturing that dream and you know never talking me out of it, um, and then trying to see what they do at their level. You know, find the books, find the find everything that could fuel that passion, and I'm hugely thankful to them today. Now, Tama had previously flown to space aboard a Soyuz spacecraft, but this was obviously his first time flying aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft. Uh, but what's the differences? What was training like uh, between the two? Here's Soma talking about that. It's actually quite a transition because um, the Soyuz being much less automated and uh, and uh, me having been the, the pilot on the Soyuz with the Russian commander, uh, you need to know everything. You need to know all the systems. You need to know you know every single dial and gauge because the, the vehicle is not going to present you the information in a synthetic way um, like the Dragon does. So there's a lot of work involved. I spent, I think, 76 weeks in Russia over the years, uh, not only for this, but mostly for that. Um, and then, and then you get comfortable enough so that you can you can fly it. Um, and then moving over to uh, Dragon. So first of all, Dragon is much more automated, much more. Um, you know, it has big screens. It shows you all the information you need to know based on the phase of flight, um, and and everything is clear, and and there's nothing. You know that you have to dig for um, and also it, it pretty much does everything by itself you're mostly monitoring you're mostly validating some steps because that's what technology does for you that's what cars will be tomorrow that's what you know that's what's good um, so there's one and also uh, transitioning now I'm a mission specialist which means I'm not the commander or the pilot of the spacecraft so less involved in the, in the actual flying of the vehicle um, and the way we split the tasks is really um, we, I'm saying with Uzaki, the other mission specialist, we're going to be responsible of everything that's pretty, that's, that's pretty much manual. So if somebody needs to open the hatch, somebody needs to, um, you know, if there's an emergency and they, you need to use the raft or, uh, or um, all that stuff is going to be on us. Uh, we're going to be in charge of cargo, of stowage. Uh, we're going to be in charge of valves, of going behind panels. We're going to be charged, in charge of fixing things. So everything that's manual is going to be on us. Um, and everything that's really related to flying the spacecraft from the screens, from the seats, is mostly on the, the other two uh, crew members. Now, with all this excitement of returning astronauts to the moon, we wanted Tomas' answer for, for what he thought about this uh, global view of returning astronauts to the moon and beyond. Here's Tomas talking about that. I think what we're seeing is, uh, is that now things are happening in a much more international context. Um, now you need partnerships. Um, to achieve the to achieve the goals, because going to space is ambitious. Going to Mars is a lofty goal, and we'll need everybody's uh, goodwill and participation to get there. Um, and it makes things more complicated, obviously, because people don't speak the same language, they don't have the same priorities, they don't have they're not at the same place, you know, technologically or or historically or politically or whatever. Um, so you have to harmonize all this, and that takes time. Uh, which is what sometimes people feel it should go faster. But over the long run, uh, everybody is convinced that it's beneficial because over the long run, you achieve, you achieve more. Um, I think competition between countries is a very powerful engine. If you want to start, uh, you know, space exploration, that's going to get you there real fast. Uh, but then it dies pretty quickly because once somebody has won the race, then what do you do? And why would you keep running? Um, and so and then you, you switch to cooperation, you switch to scientific goals, more than politically, politically motivated goals, let's say. Um, but then, yeah, you get maybe less budget, you get maybe less traction initially, uh, but you get something more solid and something that can, that can go for, you know, our, uh, uh, years or decades. And that's the phase that we're in, in, um, in space exploration. So I think that we're really going to the moon. I think we're going to go uh, as a partnership. I think it makes it more challenging, um, but I think it also makes it um, more uh, more durable on the on the long run, uh, and we're going to achieve more. So I'm looking forward to being part of this. ESA has actually signed with NASA some agreements, and and they'll be they 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 want to be a reliable partner for Artemis and the Gateway uh, for the years to come on the. On it for the long term. I love how you said that Earth is just a big spaceship with a crew it needs looking after. Can you just tell us how going to space affects your views on the environment? Yeah, it's um, it's. Uh, I mean, it feels it feels artificial, but that, that's really how that's really what happens. I think we're not 
human beings are not um, designed, our brains are not equipped, uh, you know, for huge distances and big numbers. We can only understand, like, for real, uh, what we can feel, what we can experience. We, we're, you know, we're basic animals um, in that respect. Uh, so we gave ourselves some tools like mathematics um, to, to kind of understand the world a little bit better, but still we're not touched by numbers and we don't understand them. I mean, as long as there's more than six zeros, for me, I don't, I, I, I can, I can perform a mathematical operation, but I don't know what it means. It doesn't mean anything to me. Um, and so that's what's happening with, with the Earth. The Earth is just too big. It's just too vast. You, it doesn't look like it's fragile. It doesn't look like it needs taken care of. It doesn't look like a, a, like six things could go wrong. And then, and then you take a, a huge step back by putting yourself uh, 400 kilometers over above the surface of the Earth. And then suddenly you see it. And then you know that Earth is round, it's finite, and it's not that big, and the cosmos around it is, is empty and vast and dead. You see it with your brain, but seeing it with your eyes and having this sensory experience of putting the, 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 the Earth at your own scale, right? You reduce the scale of the Earth so that you can experience it, feel it, and that makes you really understand things from a completely different perspective. So I think that's what... That's what people mean when they talk about the overview effect of, or things like this. It's a change of perspective that, that puts the Earth and the global phenomena like climate change um, kind of at your scale and at a scale that you can that you can not only understand but also experience, and that changes everything. Your space journey. We're incredibly excited about the Crew 2 mission and wish the best for astronauts Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma. If you'd like to learn more, just go to nasa.gov forward slash commercial crew. I really want to thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to give us a like or share, we'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, if you have any comments, feel free to reach out to us at yourspacejourney.com. Meanwhile, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, just a reminder to uh, keep dreaming, uh, soar for the sights above and uh, just don't let the world hold you back uh, whatever you think is possible we certainly believe that and we're seeing it now all around us in this amazing field of space exploration thanks again for joining us today we'll see you next time god bless <laughs>